Thank you for joining in with Eric Giesen and myself, Crystal White, today. We are going to be presenting the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Fundamentals Part 2. Today we're going to be going over income and income qualifications. This training course is being presented again as an interim fundamentals during the COVID-19 crisis. This is not in lieu of any of our compliance fundamentals training courses, and we suggest that you participate in full compliance fundamental classes upon opening up the schedule. No certificate will be issued after this webinar class as it's just a webinar to get us through. The policies and regulations that are outlined today are the requirements of the IRS and or of the commission. Additional policies, procedures may be imposed by management, owners, additional programs such as HUD, RV, HOME, Housing Trust Fund, and other local and state programs. Check with your owner or management company to ensure that you follow all of their policies and programs for the property. In qualifying a household to move into the property, there are five areas of household qualification. First, you need to determine the household composition. You need to determine whether the household meets the full-time student rule. You need to do an income calculation and make sure that the household meets is at or below the income limit. The, whether or not the household meets a state commitment qualification if necessary. And then the rent must stay re restricted for that household. We're going to discuss the full-time student issue and the income qualification and how to calculate the income for the household. When calculating the income, there's three types of income that we look at. There's earned income, such as working uh, at a job or self-employment earned income, but there's also unearned income, such as social security or unemployment or income that is being given to the household from outside sources. And then there's income from assets, such as a bank account or stocks that are paying dividends or interest. We need to add up all these types of income and calculate up to the gross annual income for the household. The tax credit program only deals with the gross income. It does not deal with net income such as some of the other programs like HUD, USDA. We deal only with gross annual income. When calculating the income, all amounts, whether they're monetary or not, that go into or received on behalf of the household is considered income. This is a little bit different thinking of the definition of income that we're used to. Any monetary or not types of amounts coming into the household, a non-monetary would be such as the household's car payment being made every single month by somebody outside of the household. That would be not monetary. If somebody in the household has income, is working a job, and they bring home a check, that would be a monetary type of income. All amounts that are anticipated to be received from sources outside of the household during the next 12 months are to be calculated. This is known income. If you have a household member or an applicant that comes to your office and says, I anticipate getting a job next year, but they have nothing lined up, no start date, and no um, confirmation uh, from an employer, that is not a known income source yet. If they start in a week and they have confirmation that they're starting a week, then that would be a known uh, anticipated amount. So we only count the income that is anticipated and known that they're going to receive in the next 12 months. Uh, all income amounts that are derived from assets, such as, uh, like we stated before, income, dividends, etc., 
will be uh, counted. And this is assets that they have access to, which we will talk about later. We always use the gross income except for self-employment. And there's two definitions that we need to know. One is sporadic. Sporadic is undeterminable. It, undeterminable. it is not expected and is not consistent. We do not count sporadic as income. Sporadic is an amount that is we do not know that is going to be received and is a surprise, and it's one time or less during the year. The other definition is periodic. Periodic payments are predicted, consistent, expected, and they're verifiable. Periodic payments, we consider any two payments or more during the uh, year, calendar year, would be considered periodic. We count periodic payments. A pay periodic payment would be considered a relative who is giving the household money every month or at least twice during the year. That would be considered periodic. We know what's coming and it's consistent. And therefore, we can verify it. Next, we need to determine who is part of the household and which type of income from that household member do we count? First, we have the head of household. We count all of their earned income and we count their unearned income. There's a spouse of the head of household and it's the same. We count both the earned and the unearned income. Then we have a co-head who is not a spouse, but a co-head of the household, we also count both their earned and their unearned income. Other adults in the household, we again, both earned and unearned. Dependents, children under 18, we do not count their earned income, but we do count their unearned income. Full-time students who are over 18, the full-time student status needs to be verified. And we do count their under-earned income. However, for their earned income, we only count up to $480. Any amount they receive over that is not counted as income. Foster children under the age of 18, we do not count their earned income but we do count their unearned income. And then live-in aides are defined as somebody who's not part of the household, but they are living in the household to take care of uh, needs that somebody with a disability has. And since live-in live aides are not part of the household, we do not count their earned, nor do we count their unearned income. We do need to count all the anticipated income and the income from the assets uh, who will call this their primary resident and they're expected to live in the unit for the next 12 months. There may be some adults who are temporarily uh, away, but do consider this their full-time residence. We need to also count their income since this is their primary residence and they are temporarily away. Once we have collected information about the household's income, we need to third party verify all of that income uh, with third parties. So with the employers and with a DSHS or social security, et cetera. Um, in doing income qualification, we wanna make sure that we're planning ahead, giving ourselves enough time and that we're documenting all of our work. Prove how you calculated your work. Verify all the data. Pretend we're going to court and you are proving your case in court. You have all of the documentation that shows where you obtain that information. Uh, be thorough, be prompt, and prove your work. And never, ever, ever use whiteout or other correction tape or fluids uh, on these certification forms. Do not scribble out information on the form. 
replace one line uh, through the mistake and initial and move on. And please never use highlighters on the forms. Jumping into third party verifications, the first attempt of verification needs to be a third party written verification form. The document verifies, you need to document your verified attempts with date and time and who you attempted to contact. This needs to be attempted three times in two weeks. The third party written verification never gets transported by the resident to the third party verifier. It can be sent through the mail, through a fax, or through email. Make sure you verify how you transported it to and from. If you tr transport it to the third party verifier by an appropriate means, but then the tenant walks it back to you, you need to re verify it with a phone clarification. Residents should never transport the third party written verification forms. Review the verification form for clarity and thoroughness and make sure it answers all of the questions on the form. Any uh, missing or illegible or unclear facts need to be clarified with the third party uh, verifier. A known employer who will not complete a third party verification, uh, you must document and include it in the certification that they are a known employer who will not uh, complete third party verification. In this situation, if you've attempted the third party written verification and they did not respond, you've attempted three times, or they're known as an employer who will not fill out third party written verification, you can go to the next step, which is second party or third party verbal uh, verification. In this situation, uh, you would document the verbal uh, conversation on our forms. You would obtain the name and the source, the position and the contact information, provide your name, signature, date, and time of the conversation. You must back up your verbal verification with a document, such as pay stub, uh, taxes W-2. Second party verification would be the next step if you're unable to get the third party written. The document must provide six consecutive documents with all pages. So if they're providing their uh, monthly or weekly pay stub, you need to have six consecutive pay stubs. If the tax return is being provided, uh, must provide the full signed tax return or the e-file confirmation uh, printout. And then the last case, if you're unable to obtain the third party uh, written, third party verbal, and the second party statement, then the last uh, verification would be the first party, which is a statement directly from the resident. This must um, be a notarized statement from the resident. One of the more common verification means nowadays is third party verifiers such as the work number. If they're a known employer or you find out that they are uh, utilizing the work number, I document that they utilize the work number and attempt with a clarification form to obtain as much information from the employer as possible. At the very minimum, attempt to get the applicant start date from the employer. Many times, anything from the employer is difficult, but attempt what you can. Document your use of the work number and that no additional information will be provided by the employer. Check the accuracy of the printout from the work number and compare it to at least one pay stub, most current pay stub, uh, that is, is listed on the work number. In lieu of the work number verification obtained, you can go back to the, the uh, second party verification by obtaining six consecutive uh, pay stubs. Uh, from the pay stubs and the start date, determine the resident's uh, current pay rate and year to date and do the calculations that you need. The work number sometimes has a fee 
and this fee can be passed on to the resident under the tax credit program. Some other programs do not allow this fee to be passed on. Great, so now we're gonna go into calculating employment income. Now that you have your verification back, how do you calculate that going forward? Some examples would be your hourly wages times 2080. That is if somebody works full time. The number of hours working full time projected for a 12 month period is 2080. So if somebody makes 1350 an hour times 2080 hours, that would be $28,080 per year. Another way to calculate that is there are 52 weeks in a year. So if they make $540 per week, you would calculate that times 52 weeks to equal the same amount. Biweekly, if the resident is paid biweekly or applicant is paid biweekly, it would be times 26 pay periods per year because remember if they're paid bi-weekly, it's every two weeks, meaning 26. Semi-monthly would be times 24, and monthly wages would be times 12. For less than full-time employment, you would calculate the hourly wages times the number of hours they work per week times 52 weeks. So an example would be 1350 an hour times 27 hours a week, if they work 27, times 52 weeks in a year would equal 18,954. Um, annualizing your year to date. This is important to remember because you have to calculate both ways. So you have to project their income for the next 12 months. And then you also have to look back at their year to date and annualize that. You'll take the year to date income that's listed on the verification of employment or on the pay stubs. You're going to divide that by the number of weeks worked and then times that by 52. So let's say that their year-to-date income is $13,080. They worked from January 1st of 2017 to July 12th of 2017. If you look at dayandweekcounter.com or you go to your uh, year-to-date calendar that you have printed out, you would see that that is 27 weeks. <clears throat> you take the 1380 that they made, divide that by 27 weeks, and project that forward for the next 12 months or 52 weeks to get $25,494.11. Please note that the year to date period actually 193 days or 27.57 weeks. You do not round partial weeks up for the year-to-date calculation, okay? Use 27.5. You don't use 27.5. Additional considerations. You must use the higher, either the year-to-date that we went over or the hourly calculation going forward. So make sure that you do it both ways. Use the highest hours per week if there's a range given. So if on the employment verification, it says that they're gonna work anywhere from 20 to 25 hours per week, you would always use the 25 as the higher. <clears throat> if that overqualifies the household, you then need to obtain additional written clarification from the employer. This should not be done on a clarification memo verbally. You should have written documentation to back up the change. If you don't, and it comes back next year that the resident is over income, it will come into question. Include all anticipated raises, tips, bonuses, commissions, and any other pay. These may or may not be included in the year to date. Tip income, if the employer does not disclose. So let's say that your applicant or resident works in the service industry, or as a taxi driver, or works in a salon or as a server. And on the employment verification, you notice that there are no tips disclosed. We ask that you use a 20% tip amount. If they work in the gaming industry as a Concedo uh, representative, let's say that they're a black card uh, 
I'm sorry, a poker viewer at a casino. You get their employment verification back and you notice that the employer did not list that they received tips. We, if you cannot clarify that in written form, then we ask that you use a 40% gaming industry tip income extra. Show your work and your calculations. This is very important. If there's ever changeover in your office and you send your files to the commission at the end of the year when your reports are due and we go through the files and we are trying to calculate the income that you listed and our income does not come up to what you show, we want to be able to see how you came up with that income. If you can't figure that out and we can't figure that out, remember what we come up with is usually what that tenant file should show. So unless you can show how you got it differently than us, our calculations usually are correct. Site employees not in a common area unit must include any rent concessions that are given. If an employee, if employed by a family member, then you must provide a pay stub in addition to the verification that is in the file. Calculating seasonal income. This is a big one. Remember that you're projecting income for the next 12 months. So in order to show that, you need to calculate wages plus any unemployment. Let's say that you have a landscaper. He is going to be moving into your property. Right now you're in May and May, June, July, and August are usually when he is employed and the rest of the year he is off. What is he going to do during that off time? You need to make sure that you have that documented. You need to either count the unemployment or if he states that he is going to be using his savings or other means to pay his rent and utilities and other bills, you would need to show that. If he says he's gonna use his bank account but then you verify his bank account and he has zero dollars in there, you're gonna to have to ask him. Unfortunately, it shows that your bank account is at zero and you say that you're gonna use your savings to pay for your rent and utilities, but I just don't see that income there. You need to ask those questions. Also see our seasonal worker statement, but make sure that you are counting the full 12 months and asking those questions not just going off of what they say. If they're only gonna work four months, you get the verification back that they're only working the four months. You need to provide additional documentation to show what they're gonna do for the additional months to make up the 12. Business income. Somebody comes into your apartment complex or a tenant that has lived there and they're self-employed. They need to make sure and complete the self-employment verification form. And then they need to submit the most recent entire signed tax return. Remember that it needs to be the entire tax return and it must be signed. Even if they file electronically, they can print out the form and sign it and turn it into you. The 1040 generally requires if net earnings, is generally required if the net earnings are $400 or more, including the Schedule C, D, and or F, and or the Schedule K-1. If they don't have a tax return because they didn't make over 400, or if this is their first year, you can also submit a profit and loss. Remember that this is only for new businesses. Request further documentation from the resident if there is ever a question and complete and submit a self-employment income worksheet. For business income or self-employment, this is the only time that we use the net income from your business. Business income must be greater than zero. They can't earn a business and have no income coming from it. This is a profit and loss expense statement that you can make up at your property if you don't have one. You need to list, or they need to list, the company name and then the amount of income and expenses that they have per month. 
On this sheet, you see in January, this property, or I mean, I'm sorry, this business earned $186. They had expenses of $61, so their net income for January is $125. As long as their expenses look legitimate, remember we are not a tax preparer and we are not the police, but as long as their expenses look legitimate, you should be able to use this to project income. Their yearly income from this business is $1,218 and their yearly expenses is $715, making their net profit for the business of $503. That $503 is what you would list as their income on the HEC. This is an example of the Schedule C that you would see on a tax return if somebody is self-employed. As you can see by <clears throat> line 11, this is who paid for it. Contract labor. You need to, if they have that on there, who paid for it? Depletion, you add this back into the net income that they have listed. And depreciation, you also add that back into the net. So items, line items 12 and 13 get added back into the net income. Wages, who did you pay wages? Was that a Another applicant, was that a family member? Was that somebody that resides in the unit? Because then you need to make sure that you counted that income in their income as well. Other expenses, are they reasonable? Are they not reasonable? Again, remember that we are not a tax preparer, but you should be able to see if they look reasonable or not. Let's say that um, you have a self-employed, Lyft driver, because Lyft is self-employed. The Lyft driver makes $200 per month. Then they write off or have expenses of $180 per month. So their net income for that month is $20. Does that sound reasonable? I would probably question that. You would want to ask and see what they are paying in order to only make $20 per month. And then line 31, that's your net profit or loss. So you would take line 31, add back in if you need to, line 12 and line 13, and that should be the net income that they are listing as income from their self-employment. Then we move on to Social Security. Social Security, you need to verify and count all anticipated benefits, including anticipated start of Social Security, SSI, or survivor benefits. You need to obtain the most current statement. Always use the gross. So if they're getting Medicaid deducted, you would make sure and count the gross, not the net. Delayed Social Security or SSI payments are not counted as income, but could be counted as an asset. And SSI recipients may also receive $40 supplemental income. This would be verified through your DSHS verification. Garnishments are not deducted, so if they have a garnishment, you would count the gross, not the net. Count amount after overpay has been deducted with documentation that it will be greater than 12 months. So if they receive um, a deduction and the deduction is $50 per month, but they only have $100 left in overpayment that they need to pay back, you would make sure and only deduct for the amount that they still have to pay back. You wouldn't count that deduction for the full 12 months unless it is for the 12 months. So you need to watch that. Another thing with Social Security is you need to make sure 
that your applicant or resident is not of social security age. So if you have somebody come in and apply and they answer on the REA that they are not receiving social security but they are of age to receive it, I would question that and ask them if they anticipate um, going in and applying for it, if they're already in the application process, or if they've been denied and they're disputing it, or what is going on exactly with their social security. Uh, because it could put them over income if you don't count it this year and then they receive it and you find that out the next year. So if they are of age, I would definitely make sure and count it if they are going to or have or are in the process of disputing any part of that. Also make sure that you are watching out for the cost of living adjustment. This usually happens in October or November of each year. Uh, and you can watch our website for the letter that comes out about it to anticipate what the percentage is going to be but make sure that you are looking for that if you are doing recertifications or moving somebody in in that timeline of when that cost of living increase could happen you can visit also um, ssa.gov and my account if you are unable to get a verification back from social security the applicant or resident can log into their account online and it will show what their amount that they should receive if they apply for or get approved for Social Security. So you can walk them through that in your office. It's a little bit tricky. They ask quite a few questions or you can call Social Security with them in the office and they should be able to get you over some sort of a statement. Statements usually come out in December of every year, November or December. If you do have a senior property and you have lots of tenants that are on Social Security, I suggest that you post up on the mailboxes a letter that says, hey, it's that time of year again for your Social Security award letter to come in. Please make sure you bring it to the office so that we can keep it in our files and that way when it comes time for you to recertify, we already have a copy of it and you don't lose it. As a reminder, we will accept this statement for the whole year. So there's no time limit on it. They receive it in December, have them come in, bring you a copy of it, put it in their file, and use that for the full year. It will tell you when the benefits start. So this one says beginning December of 2019. Here is the full amount of Social Security is $910.50. This applicant or resident does not have any deductions for medical insurance and $910 and zero cents is what they receive. But remember, we use the gross. So you would count $910 and 50 cents times 12. This is the COLA increase. Uh, showing that they received or will receive an increase of 1.6% in 2020 because of the COLA increase. And we will accept this for all of 2020. This tenant has a gross amount of $1,370.90. They also have a Medicare deduction of $135.50 making their net income 1235.40. Remember, we use the gross. So on this one, you would count $1,370.90. So next we are going to talk about child support payments. You must count the amount listed from the court order that the custodial parent will receive on the certification unless the applicant certifies that they are not receiving the child support payments and that all reasonable legal actions to collect that amount including filing with the appropriate courts or agencies responsible for enforcing those payments have been completed. 
only count what the resident actually receives. This verification would be uh, the child support enforcement um, verification form. And then here in Washington State, DSHS will uh, send out a, pr a printout of the child support payments. When you get the statement, you'll also want to check and see if any back payments are being made at the same time. You'll want to count uh, what is listed that they are receiving. So utilize the child support enforcement verification, utilize the court order, or review the divorce decree. And then if neither one of those are available, last resort would be utilize the child support aff affidavit form. Spousal supports and alimony payments, uh, the income or assets being given to the household. You'll want to, again, review the divorce decree and you'll want the entire divorce decree as part of the certification. A notarized gift affidavit from the individual who is giving the alimony would be sufficient or you can get a notarized gift affidavit from the receiver, uh, the, the resident, um, who is receiving that alimony payment. Next is gift. So, all gifts or support from friends and family, so again, those monetary or not items that are coming into the household must be counted as income. So cash contribution to the household from an outside source would be considered income. If a friend or a family member is giving $500 a month to the household, that $500 a month will be considered income. Non-cash contributions to the household are also counted as income, such as somebody outside the household is paying for the household's gas every month or their insurance or their cell phone, or buying personal items. Those would be considered as income. Funds from private sources, including direct rental payments, such as friends, family, churches, agencies, et cetera, who are making payments to the, uh, on behalf of the household are considered income. However, it does not need to be the same person each month. So if there's a different church who is paying the household's rent each month, that payment is consistent, although not from the same place, it is consistent every month, therefore needs to be counted as income. You never count the value of food or groceries given to the household. If the household is given 10 bags full of groceries, this is not counted as income. However, if somebody from outside the household gives the household a $100 grocery store gift card, this would then be considered income because it's monetary. Child care payments that are paid directly to the child care provider is not counted as income. Any assistance um, from a federal, state, or local government for rental assistance is not considered income. There are multiple private agencies that will pay for the tenant's rent and that assistance actually comes from federal government funds. As long as those agencies can verify and prove that those funds are federal, state, or local funds, then that, those rental assistance payments would be considered exempt income. These items can be verified by utilizing a notarized gift affidavit. Types of payments in lieu of earnings would be unemployment, disability, and workers' compensation. These must be annualized. Unemployment is generally approved for six months. However, it can be renewed. Therefore, you need to count it as an annual um, annualized payments. You must, you must verify with the third-party verification 
or the benefit statement. Uh, unearned income from DSHS. Cash assistance is counted as income. TANF, which comes in the form of TANF, or refugee cash assistance, general assistance, or age-blind disabled assistance. Basic food is never counted as income. And remember that TANF or DSHS funds, they receive their benefits on a cash card and the, the um, cash card could be considered an asset. Next would be uh, 401k, retirement, VA benefits, et cetera. If the household is receiving periodic payments, they're receiving monthly payments uh, from these funds, then it would be considered income. If not, if no periodic payments are being received, they either get it all in one lump sum or they're not receiving any at all, then these accounts would be considered assets and we will talk about assets during the asset uh, PowerPoint. So you would utilize the appropriate verification form to verify these payments. Um, you need, or you need to get the most current benefit statement. Remember, the VA follows the Social Security COLA. The pension or the retirement, you would utilize current letter, and the IRA annuities, you would utilize the current statement. In the tax credit program, student financial assistance is excluded from the household income. Unlike HUD and USDA, we do not, uh, we do not count uh, financial assistance as income unless the household is receiving Section 8 or USDA assistance. Then we must count student financial assistance received by all adult students, except when a, the adult students who are over the age of 23 and have a dependent child and adult students who are dependent of the household, then we would uh, not count in that situation. So if they are receiving some sort of assistance such as Section 8 or USDA, we would count that assistance and we would need to count that financial assistance received by all adults unless there are some exceptions as listed. Next, we'll talk about military pay. Uh, on military pay, uh, we count regular pay, special pay, and allowances, such as military basic, the basic allowance for housing, the basic allowance for sustenance, clothing allowance, and other special allowances. Do not count hostile fire imminent danger pay, nor do you count reenlistment bonuses. Basic allowance for housing is excluded at properties in the following counties that placed in service after July 30th of 2008. These counties are Kitsap, Mason, Jefferson, Pierce, King Island, and Snohomish. The basic allowance for housing must be included in income calculations at properties in these counties that place in service before July 30th, 2008, and at all properties in all other counties in Washington. This rule is in uh, consideration of uh, Banger uh, military base and all the counties around it. When, utilize, when looking at a, a military pay stub, this is what it will look like. If you have a military uh, household member that is moving to the area and they're not yet sure what their pay will be, you can look it up um, by looking at their grade, their years of service, their branch, 
Um, and you can go to the militarypay.defense.org and you can look up the uh, what their pay is going to be. The pay is generally listed on their pay stub um, as the example on the screen. Real estate. If the real estate is producing income, such as a rental, then it is considered income. If the real estate is sitting vacant and is not producing income, then it would be considered an asset, and we will talk about that during the asset presentation. So determine the rental income. You need to get the annual rent payment, and you subtract the mortgage interest payment not the principal payment, only the interest payment, and you would also subtract other allowable expenses, such as utilities, insurance, taxes, repairs, etc. And this will give you the uh, income amount from that asset. To verify the rent payment, you would want to get a copy of the tenant's lease. For the mortgage interest payment, you want to get a copy of the mortgage statement. And to get the other allowable expenses, you will want to get a copy of an expense statement. You could also get a verification uh, via their 1040 IRS uh, tax schedule with the Schedule E and a copy of the lease. You want to verify whether there's going to be an, a rent increase but you can get a copy of their taxes to verify this also. If there is a adult member of the household who has no income at all, that adult household member must complete a zero income certification and they must complete all questions one, two, and three. Please note, Question three states, I will be using the following sources of funds to pay for rent and other necessities. If somebody is paying on behalf of this individual, you must put enter that individual's name or the uh, full source name. We want to know the name of the person, not husband, wife, friend, daughter. We, act, we want the actual person's name. If the person or source that they list on question three is not part of the household, you will then need to start asking more questions because the source that they place on here might need to be counted as income into the household. For example, if a household member puts down my father, George Smith, is going to give me money every month for my expenses. And George Smith does not live in the household. This would be considered income, and you'll need to verify it and add it to the household's income. So, wow, Eric, we went over quite a bit today. Income qualifications. Remember to ask and double ask. If it doesn't look right, ask again. If you're filling out your rental eligibility application with your tenant or with your applicant, while they're sitting there in front of you filling it out, if they look hesitant or if something is left unanswered, ask. This is part of having a I guess you would call it a conversation with your tenant. It's very, very, very important that we understand that these units are income restricted. So we need to make sure that we count it all and that there's not any surprises next year when we do the recertification. Annual income includes income from many different sources. It's not just employment or self-employment. It's employment, it's self-employment, it's income from assets, which we'll go over on the next webinar, it's social security and benefits, 
It's retirement, pensions, annuities. It's things like child support, alimony, gift money that they get from a friend or a relative. It's other monetary or non-monetary sources. It's from somebody paying their phone bill to somebody paying them $100 a month to watch their friend's child to unemployment to workman's comp to welfare assistance that being you know so many different incomes that can come in student financial assistance military pay you ask it it should be on there you should be able to answer yes or no without you know double questioning it but in all reality, we have to ask and double ask because if a tenant goes over income, it could mean monetary fines or damages from the IRS. It could mean all kinds of different things. So it's very, very, very important that we ask and double ask and triple ask to make sure that we have all the documentation that we need to income qualify an applicant or a tenant. Another big thing is to make sure that you are not putting an applicant or a tenant into your unit that could be over income with a written documentation, but under the income limit with a verbal clarification. Never do that. Always make sure that it's in writing and documented from the source. Don't scribble or um, white out or um, draw lines through any employment verification that you get back or on any pay stub. Make sure that you have clear documented proof that this tenant or applicant is eligible for your housing. If you're collecting pay stubs because you can't get an employment verification, be sure that they're um, consecutive pay stubs, that you're not missing a week, that on that missing week they made a bunch more money and they might just be missing it because they're missing it or because they're missing it because they don't want to show it to you because there's some extra income in there. You always need to make sure that you are looking at dates and times and figures to get the best possible verifications that you can to move in a tenant. And with that said, we will lastly go over our main page on the compliance part of our website, wshfc.org. You can find our forms and reports, income and rent limits, our manual, our FAQs, and once open, our workshop registration. Remember, before you attend a in-person workshop registration or in-person workshop, Remember that you go to this prerequisite. Watch the resident certification forms webinar before you come to an in-person workshop. These webinars that we are currently doing online and posting for you, they do not carry the certificate that you will need to show. And um, when you come to an in-person workshop, you will get a certificate showing that you came. If you have further questions, comments, or anything, please email your portfolio analyst. Here are their email addresses and their phone numbers. If you email, make sure that you include any backup that you would like us to look at and your property's name and the OID number in the email. You can always leave a message on the phone number that's listed here. However, because we are all working remotely at this time, it is probably faster to get an email back to you than a phone call. Also remember that if you leave a message or a voicemail for any of us and you would like a call back, most of the time those calls are gonna be blocked because we are calling from our homes. And if your phone does not accept blocked calls, our phone call will more than likely not come through. So be sure to email us any questions that you have. And with that said, Eric, anything else you'd like to add? 
Uh, thank you for attending. And again, if you have any questions, we appreciate uh, you giving us an email. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. Have a great day.